Good morning. Wow. This is a nice intimate group of my 10,000 favorite friends. I'm delighted that you've come this morning. Just remarkable. Uh, my name is Tom Carew. I am the president of the Society for Neuroscience. And I want to welcome you to this opening lecture of the 2009 meeting, which I've got to tell you promises to be a, a, a watershed meeting for the society in terms of the lecturers, the special lectures, the posters, uh, and the events. Uh, it's going to be extraordinary. And this is our first time visiting Chicago. We'd love to hear from you how you enjoy the meeting, but we have every reason to believe it's going to be an extraordinary uh, time over the next few days. And let us know about uh, how you've enjoyed it. Um, we have a terrific lineup this morning as well. It's a unique event, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But uh, I first want to recognize Elsevier and thank them for their continuing support of the dialogue series. They've been very generous, and we appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to announce a couple things. One is the attendance so far at the meeting. We do this as we roll across the meeting every year. As, of, as we speak, it's 29,009. I'm confident we'll break 30,000, probably more, certainly by the end of the meeting. But more striking is an announcement that I'm privileged to make. It's our 40th anniversary as a society. And two days ago at 10.05 in the morning or whatever, we broke 40,000 as membership. So we now have 40,000 members of the society around the world. That's an extraordinary accomplishment. And I am just so pleased and privileged to be a part of that. <clears throat> It's a wonderful way to start our uh, 40th anniversary meeting. But I also have a fact, a little fact, that's really a fun one. When we started in 1970, those 40 years ago, we had a, a total membership of 1,100, 1,100 folks as the charter founding members. Of that 1,100, 500 of them are still active members of the society, and more than 100 of them are registered here in the meeting. In sure, I'm not at all surprised if not uh, many of them are sitting in this audience. And I want to thank you, the founding fathers and daughters of this society, for your wisdom and forethought to get us here and for the support you've given us. And let's all join thanking our guys. <clears throat> <clears throat> so that brings us to this morning's event, the Dialogue Series. Uh, this series was uh, begun about five years ago. This is the fifth. Uh, with the goal of having a chance to discuss with leaders in their respective fields, with experts in their field, outside of our normal day-to-day -day life as neuroscientists, uh, to learn with them about their pursuits, what they do in their lives, and especially how their lives intersect with ours, both professionally and personally. And we've had a, a really remarkable series of speakers thus far. Uh, we've had the Dalai Lama. We've had Frank Geary, who is a renowned architect. We've had Jeff Hawkins, who invented the Palm Pilot and used neural algorithms to generate uh, this wonderful device that almost all of you have on your hip as we speak. Uh, and we had Mark Morris last year, a, a gifted choreographer uh, in New York. Well, today is going to be a special one. This is a unique event. You're going to enjoy our guests today because we're going to get to have two renowned magicians, Eric Mead and Apollo Robbins, join us. Uh, after that time, th so they will come and both will perform for us uh, this morning. And after that time, we will move into the second phase of the morning, which will be a discussion here on the stage uh, with Apollo, Eric, and me, and Dr. Susanna Mar Conde Martinez uh, from the Barrow Institute in Arizona. So the four of us will sit and chat for a while and move into the third phase of the dialogue, which is your involvement, your questions and answers. Uh, we could have you all come up and join us on the stage, but I think that would be challenging in terms of human engineering. So rather than that, we've given to you uh, small note cards, uh, and you can write down your questions as you imagine them coming up, uh, for arriving here, or during their presentations, or during the talk. Send them up to the front, and then we will have three moderators here at the front who will ask your questions and broker them in ways that can perhaps uh, put a couple of them together. And our moderators are Stephen Macknick, uh, Zola, uh, Stuart Zola, and, uh, and Emily Marcus. And they will join us and, and, and bundle the questions to inform the dialogue. Um, so let me tell you why I chose this. One of the cool things about being president is you get to choose the dialogue speaker. And uh, the reason that I was taken with this particular opportunity is the, the appreciation that um, 
There's no better way to find out how our brains work, which we do for a living, all of us, and by extension how our minds work, than to find out how we can be deceived, how we can may, be made to believe in the impossible. Uh, and for centuries, magicians have been plying their trade and, and using their craft by hijacking the machinery of our brains, uh, which are normally in the service of perception and awareness and memory, and, and manipulating that machinery in clever and sometimes diabolical ways to make us believe in the impossible, to make us believe that they can make things disappear, to make us believe that they can cut somebody in two and perhaps, as importantly, put them back together, and that they can read our minds. Well, this morning, we want to read their minds. This morning, we'd like to have a discussion with them and learn from them because they've been using our brains in their profession for their professional career and the way they work. And it will be a great treat to exchange views on their use of manipulations of attention and awareness to enlighten how we think about uh, neuroscience and, and the brain. So let me tell you a little bit about our two guests. Um, one uh, is Eric Mead, the other Apollo Robbins. Eric Mead has been performing all over the world uh, as a magician, a mentalist, a speaker, and as a comedian. The latter is non-trivial. He's an amazingly funny, wonderful guy. And he's been doing this for more than 20 years. Uh, his first paid performance was at the age of nine, and then he's been publishing and lecturing since he was age 17. Uh, his recent book, called The Tangled Web, uh, has received worldwide accolades both by professional magicians around the world, but also by laymen. I think it's in its third printing, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's been very interested in his life about using mentalism and memory in his work. Um, and his performance will explore the vast potential of the human mind. What he's told me he wants to do is apply psychological principles um, and subtle deceptive techniques to delve into our imaginations and to raise questions about perception, subliminal influence, and illusion. Eric Mead's performance will be followed by Apollo Robbins, who is affectionately known in the trade as the gentleman thief. <clears throat> His performance is a dynamic blend of pickpocketing, sleight of hand, and con games. Over the course of his career, this is very cool, he has, for example, managed to borrow Jennifer Gardner's uh, engagement ring. He's been able to switch Troy Aikman and Jerome Bettis's driver's licenses. It's okay to piss off Troy Aikman. It's not okay to piss off Jerome Bettis. Those of you who know the bus don't want him on the other side of an argument. And my favorite, this is very cool. He relieved Jimmy Carter's secret service agents of their wallets, watches, and secret agendas and itineraries. <clears throat> Go Apollo. His unique skills have led him to be a leading expert in the, in the confidence, crimes, and diversion theft area. He's utilized these skills to co-produce a reality TV series, and he's founded something really, uh, I find, fascinating called WizMob Inc. Uh, it's a brain trust between former law enforcement and criminals, ex-criminals. Actually, he's with us today as part of his uh, work release program. I'm delighted to have him. <clears throat> so I think it's evident that today's dialogue will be a unique and wonderful opportunity. And let me not take any more of your time. Let me uh, ask my friend and colleague, Eric Mead, to join me on stage. <clears throat> Thank you. Ah. My name is Eric. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking to you about memory and memories and how memories are made and being photographed by this gentleman. Last night, uh, I was at the reception uh, in Tom's room, and this happened over and over again. Tom would introduce me to people, and he would say, uh, this is Eric, and he's one of our dialogue speakers for tomorrow morning. And they would say, oh, you're joining a very prestigious group of people. And I would say, really? Like who? And they would say, well, two years ago, we had the Dalai Lama. And I'd say, that is something. And, and who else have you had? <laughs> so I have this fantasy that next year someone's going to come to do the dialogues. And uh, they'll say, oh, you're joining a very prestigious group of people. And, and he'll say, like who? And they'll say, well, three years ago, <laughs> we had the Dalai Lama. And that'll be that. So uh, I'm going to talk about memory and memories. And uh, in order to do uh, this, I want to set the tone right. So I want to do a short demonstration. And um, I'm not leaving the stage permanently. Don't panic. I'm just coming out for a moment. I mean, coming out here to talk with you for a moment. 
Uh, and I think, oh, perfect. What's your name right here? Yeah. Shubhal. Shubhal. Do you speak English? Yeah. Come with me. <laughs> <coughs> Are you nervous? No. <laughs> Take my hand. Okay. Perfect. Uh, everybody give her a big round of applause for being so brave. It's important uh, you stay right there. I'm going to grab you a chair. It's important that we establish uh, that this really was a surprise to you, that you weren't expecting to come up here on the stage today, were you? You had a dream. You and Martin Luther King. Step around here. Come stand right next to me. Shuba. Shuba. And where are you from? Uh, Bombay, India. Bombay, India, which, uh, uh, yes, Mumbai. I was there for uh, like a month, two years ago, and they all still call it Bombay, but uh, it's Mumbai to me. Is that all right with you? Just fine. Mumbai. How is your memory? Do you have a pretty good memory? What was the question again? The question was, how is your memory? Bad. Really bad? Like if I asked you to remember just a handful of things, is there a chance you could do it? I will do my best for you. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to write down, I don't want anyone to see this yet, uh, uh, just a few little sp like geometric shapes. I know. Stay right there. You're, yeah, I won't allow you to be embarrassed. You're perfectly safe with me. In fact, uh, you're going to be the star of the show. So a few shapes like this. And at the bottom, I'm going to put a little line here like this. You get to look at that. No one else. Take this also. Uh, take as much time as you'd like, Shuba, and commit what's on that card to your memory. I think that neuroscience uh, has suggested that uh, short-term memory for most people is seven things plus or minus two, so I made it far less than seven. And I tried to make them really simple, take as much time as you need when you are pretty sure that you'll be able to tell me what's on that card in about two minutes, sign your name or put your initials at the bottom. It's like a little contract. My real name? Yeah, that Shupa is not your real name? It's not your real name? Okay. Uh, and let me get uh, someone, a man on the end here. What is your name? Would you come up here for just a second? I'm going to give you, uh, th that is your name, your signed card. One last look before I hand this off. One last look, yes. Would you uh, hold on to that? Just put that in your pocket. You'll be the guardian of her information. And may I have the pencil back? Yes. What do you think the odds are that in about two minutes you can tell me what was on that card? Medium. Medium. <laughs> Take your glasses off for me. And I'm just going to set them. I'm very safe. I'm just going to set them right here. We were never formally introduced. There's a chair right behind you. Take a look at that real quickly. And now uh, look at me. I'm Eric. <laughs> Good to see you. Close your eyes. Tip your head forward. I'm going to walk you back to the chair and just take a seat right there. Perfect. Keep your head tipped forward, put your hand down, keep your eyes closed, Shupa. You're not hypnotized, but I want you to listen to my voice. I'm going to take you through a very simple visualization. So you are no longer in this room with us. You are on a beach on a bright sunny day. Maybe it's Juhu Beach. And you look down and your feet are bare, and I want you in the hot sand with your big toe in your mind's eye to just draw a great big X in the sand so that you can see that there. Do you see it in your mind's eye? Good. And now as you look up across the water, you see a sailboat. And what's surprising to you about the sailboat is the sail is not white like you would normally expect. It's bright red, a bright red sail moving left to right across your vision. And now you look across and there's a little set of houses built up on a hillside across the bay there. Can you see that in your mind's eye? Yes? And now let your face carry up and you see the sun, squint your eyes, look directly into the sun. You can't do that for long though, so from the sun bright blue sky, back down to the houses on the hill, back to the sailboat, and now back down to the sand at your feet where the wave has come in and washed away that shape. Okay. okay. 
I'm going to snap my fingers and you open your eyes. Or, or open one eye. <laughs> and uh, get your bearings and then stand back up. Okay. Gentlemen with the card, would you stand up? You don't have to come up onto the stage. Um, but you're going to be our kind of our yeah, uh, scientist. You're the control. You're the control. Right? So um, how many shapes are you remembering from that card you signed? Five. Uh, six. six. Tell me, um, how many shapes are actually on the card? He says five. I forgot the line at the bottom. Oh, forget the line at the bottom. That was for you to sign. What was at the top of the card? Four. She says four. You say five. Tell us the four shapes you're remembering, please. Circle, cross, triangle, square, like the cross in the sand, like the sail of the sailboat might be a triangle, like the shape of a house might be the box, and the circle is like a sun. But it was a bright blue day, so when you looked up in the sky, there was something you didn't see? The cross at the bottom? The cross at the bottom. No. What else is on the top of that card, sir? A star. And remember I said I would try to get you to forget something, and if you did, you'd be the star of my show. Give her a round of applause. I'm going to take you back over here. Get your glasses. Wait, I got them. Your glasses. That's Shubha. There she goes. Uh, so, uh, normally if I perform that in any other context, I would leave it there and you would be left to draw your own conclusions about it. But I want to say uh, that there's nothing scientific about that demonstration, that it is a theatrical demonstration. Just to kind of make a point about memory and to kind of set the tone for us. It brings up the question though, can a magician really truthfully manipulate the way you remember things? And the answer is Yes, and that's what I want to spend the next couple of minutes talking to you about. Why, why would I want to do that? Well, one reason maybe uh, that when you do illusions for a living and you show someone something that they find to be amazing, you want that to hold up over time. You don't want them to be able to analyze it after the fact and figure out the, the trick to it. So it's important after the show that people remember certain things and forget certain things because the things that they forget are kind of clues to how the tricks work. And so an hour after my show or a week after my show when they're explaining to their friends, describing what happened, I want them to leave out and not remember very important details that would be clues to how the illusions actually work. So I'm going to take you through um, the process of how a magician might think about this with a very simple example, all right? Like a rudimentary uh, situation that comes up in magic often. So let's say I have in my outside jacket pocket right here something, and it's something secret that the audience doesn't know about, and I need to get that secret thing out of my pocket and into my hand secretly without you noticing or remembering. It doesn't matter what the secret thing is or what I'm going to do with it. I'm not here to reveal specific magician's secrets. I'm here to just kind of talk about general principles. Uh, so just suffice to say there's something secret. I have to get it out. I don't want you to notice or remember. So how do we do this? Well, a beginning magician or an inexperienced magician or a bad magician uh, might Think about the idea of misdirection and about getting people to look away or to look somewhere else. So he might point at someone in the audience and say, what is your name and where are you from? And as the audience's attention turns to that person, he quietly puts his hand in his pocket and takes it out. And maybe that would fool some percentage of the people who looked at the woman or man in the audience, but really this is not very good magic technique because a lot of people would still see this action and say, hey, why did he just put his hand in his pocket? Maybe that has something to do with the trick. And then, of course, that's a clue to how the trick works, and this is why it's not very good magic. So, a magician who thinks more about this and thinks deeply about it realizes that putting your hand in your pocket and taking your hand out looks purposeful. It looks like you're doing something. Right? Why is he doing that? What did he just do? So maybe it would be better to apply symmetry and try to make it look not purposeful. So what if both hands go into my pockets and then both hands come out? Well, this looks much better, I think. So look at the difference between this, right? You would notice that, and this. 
And you might not notice that. So a better magician thinks further, and he says, you know, if I do this one time and they see me do that, it may or may not pass, but what if I conditioned them all along through my show that this is a normal thing for me to do? So when he first walks out and is introduced, he'll stop, he'll make his introductory comments, and he'll do it with his hands in his pockets. And then he'll take his hands out of his pockets and show them to you empty, and then continue with his show. And then three or four minutes later, while he's talking about traveling to Mumbai, uh, or Juhu Beach, he'll do this for a moment and he'll let you see his empty hands so that now 20 or 30 minutes into the show when he needs the secret thing, his hands go into his pockets, he talks for a moment, they come out, and since you've seen this many, many times, you don't notice it or remember it, you put no importance on it. But we're not done yet. A more advanced magician will say, you know what, there's still something wrong with putting your hands in your pockets and taking your hands out of your pockets for no reason. So what if I had a reason to put my hand in my pocket? I go in, I get the secret thing, but I come out with something at my fingertips, like a rubber band, let's say. So I go in, I come out with a rubber band, and I hand it to somebody. Now, my hand went into my pocket, and you might say, why did he put his hand in his pocket? But there's, when my hand comes out, you go, ah, to get a rubber band. Now I understand. And you don't remember or put any importance on that. Maybe we could prevent you from asking the question at all, why is his hand in his pocket? So I'm going to tell you in advance that I need a rubber band for this. I do a little search, ah, here's one, there's a rubber band. Burying this even further down using psychology to make sure that these things seem unimportant, not, not memorable. I'm going to skip a couple of steps here because um, there are some things, uh, magician's techniques, that I don't really feel comfortable sharing in a public forum. But I will jump to kind of the end of this and tell you what I think a really well-constructed method of getting a secret thing out of the pocket is. So I'm going to put all this together. And I'm never going to let your attention be on this hand, right? So here's what it might look like. I need a rubber band for this, and I begin to search with both hands. Both hands go into my pocket and my face, sort of little acting, gives you the impression that I'm searching and then, aha, I find what I'm looking for. Now my body weight shifts to this side, my attention goes to this side. This hand comes out first, a little bit before my right hand with a rubber band and a nice arcing action which your eye follows. This hand then comes out and rests. I hand that to you and now there is literally no way for you to remember that my hand went into my pocket and came out because it's just buried, buried uh, and not encoded, right? We think about uh, neuroscience says that memory is encoding first, then storage, then retrieval. Well, I think the most effective way of preventing someone from remembering something is to never let them encode it in the first place. It gets buried under layers of psychology and acting, and you don't see it, you don't encode it, and you can't remember it. So that's one idea. More interesting maybe to the people in this room is the idea of planting false memories, which is something magicians uh, know about and have been doing for centuries. It's been written about in our literature. And uh, in a certain very real way, it's related to the kind of work that Elizabeth Loftus has been doing. Uh, you might know about the, th the study she did where she could make children, make a grown-up believe that when they were a child, they had a, an actual, they weren't lying, they had an actual memory of something that was not real and was planted in their heads. Well, I can do this too but I don't have to involve the person's family and a phony diary and family stories and weeks of study. I can do it in seconds. Actually have you watch a series of things happen and then later on when you're asked to remember it, you misremember some important details. Uh, and I'm gonna give you one uh, very rudimentary example of how a magician might do this. So um, let's say that I'm doing a card trick and in this trick, uh, what's going to happen is I'm gonna have a card chosen Deck will be shuffled up, and then I have someone pick a card and remember it. They put it back in the deck. Uh, the deck is shuffled again, and then something amazing happens, and the, the card that you chose is revealed. Um, the secret of this particular trick, uh, without actually revealing the secret, but the secret is when you put your card back into the deck, I have to handle the cards for a moment and do something that I'm not going to tell you what it is. doesn't matter what it is, right? The point is, I have to handle the cards for a moment at the moment you put your card back into the deck. 
and I don't want you to remember this. Well, this isn't the kind of thing I can really hide from you and keep you from encoding. It is something you're going to see happen. So uh, I'm going to reframe a memory and make a picture for you of something that didn't happen and plant that into your mind. And here's what it would really look like, okay? I hand you a deck of cards. And I say, would you please shuffle those as much as you'd like to make sure that they're thoroughly mixed? And you do. And then I say, cut them, in fact, cut them many times so that you're certain no one could know the order of their cards. And you do. And now I say, I don't want to touch them. Would you put them down on the table, please, and spread them out across the table? And you do that. And at this point, I make a mental snapshot of what's on the table in front of me because in a minute, I'm going to need to make that, make, to repeat this and make it look exactly like that. Okay? So I make a quick picture of exactly what this looks like. Now I say, take your index finger, if you would, and pull any card out of the spread there. Notice that word, pull. Pull any card out of the spread there. And you do. And now would you pick it up, and it's very, very important that you remember this card. In fact, show it to a few people around you so that they can help you remember that's how important it is. And while you're doing that, and your attention is on trying to remember this card and showing it to other people without saying anything, I reach down and I scoop up the cards that were on the table, and I hold them in my hand. And once we're sure that you've remembered the card, I spread the cards in my hands, and I say, put your card back anywhere. And notice that word put, put your card back anywhere, and you do, okay? And now I put them back down on the table and I spread them and I recreate that picture that we had just a moment ago, okay? So that's what's happened and you would remember all of that. So now the show continues for a little bit and I apply what magicians call time misdirection or uh, uh, parentheses of forgetfulness. Uh, the magician uh, uh, Scanio called it. Uh, basically it means, putting some distance between what happened and the reframing of this memory so that I can change, uh, so that I can convince you that what you just saw is not exactly what happened. So, I talked to this lady over here, where are you from? That's a nice necklace. The man here, do you have a $10 bill I can borrow, blah, blah, blah. There's some entertainment that happens here, but the, I have a secret agenda and that I want you to just for a moment forget what just transpired, okay? Now, we come back to the cards, and I say to you, I want you to remember exactly what happened, which is a lie. <laughs> but, you know, the most important technique in being a magician is the ability to look people in the eye and lie convincingly. It's for their benefit. You're trying to do a show. It's not like you're going to steal their money or ruin their life. It's for them but you need to be able to lie and have them believe it. So I say, I want you to remember exactly what happened. I handed you the cards and I said to shuffle them. Yes, and I get you to agree out loud, yes. And then I said to cut them several times and make sure that no one knew the order and you did that, yes, and you agree, yes. And then I said, I don't want to touch the cards, so would you please put them down on the table and spread them out, and do you remember that? Yes. And then I said to pull any card out of there and show it and remember it. Yes? Yes. Now here's the key moment. And then I asked you to push, not put, push the card back into the deck and not even you knows where it is right now. True? And you say true. You're saying true actually to the second part of my statement, but when I, I, I've actually wrapped two things together. I asked you to push the card back in and not even you knows where it is right now. And when you agree to both of those things, what I've found in my experience is the person now changes their mental picture of what happened. They don't remember me having the cards in my hand and them putting it back and me spreading the cards. What they remember after the fact is that they spread the cards, they pulled any card, they showed it to their friends, they pushed it back in and they don't know where it is and they would swear that I never handled anything. Well, this I think is something that uh, neuroscience might want to look at. As, as a way of doing the kinds of experiments that Elizabeth Loftus does uh, without having to have giant setups. I'm not quite sure how you would organize these experiments, uh, but this is why I'm here and why I'm hoping to talk to some of you because I think maybe that the knowledge magicians have about memories and how to manipulate memories might be useful in some capacity for you. That is what I came to say. Thank you very, very much for indulging me.
<clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and my colleague and one of the most interesting performers you'll see, Apollo Robbins. A round of applause for Apollo. How many think that they could never be conned? Please welcome the stars on the True TV hit show. Our next guest may change your mind. Please welcome Apollo Robbins. Oh. able to slide the money out completely unnoticed. You know, I like spotlights. I think it's a great way of telling you and showing you exactly where you should look. <laughs> Spotlight, left side, stage, implies someone's coming out. Now, that's if you trust the spotlight operator. Or his name is Ron. He's a friend of mine. I thought I would share a little bit with you, uh, because in my nature of the craft, a lot of the work that we do happens in the shadows. I'd like to shed some light on that. So, Ron, can we get a little bit of light in the audience? So many fun people here in this audience, isn't there? <laughs> and for the last 20 minutes, Eric's been doing a great job of distracting you. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. That's a lovely purse you have there. Good to see you. <laughs> how are you, sir? Very good. You shook hands so willingly before you knew who I was. <laughs> nice to meet you. Maddie? Yeah. Sarari? It's a very nice ring you've got Thank there, you. Maddie. I'm not ready for that kind of commitment, but it's a very nice ring. Uh, so many people, it's like a buffet. I don't know where to start, actually. Don't usually get this kind of thing. Hello, folks, how are you? Good to see you. Nice to meet you. Well, I'll be happy to shake your hand. Yes, good to see you. Uh, you got a lot of layers on, don't you? Hi, folks. Don't want you to feel left out as we go by. How are you, sir? Good. Good to see you. You have a smile that says, go away. <laughs> how are you? How are you, sir? Good to see you. You got a nice ring. You got a, oh, that's a buckle watch. That's a tricky kind. What time do you have, sir? It's uh, 10 to 12. 10 to 12. What is your name? Johan Storm. Johan Storm. Is that correct? Johan, this is a very big audience, and I feel very lonely doing this by myself. So would you mind joining me? Please welcome okay. Johan to the stage. Oh, Johan. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. So, Johan, I think this is interesting. Taking everything out of your pockets there, Johan? I, you understand that's half of my act there, Johan. It's, try to keep things where they are. Oh, they got two little marks here for us, too. That's wonderful. Go ahead and stand right there for me where you can see. All right, let's just turn this way so they can all see us. Doesn't take a major body language to determine what this means, but... Uh, Yes. Uh, well, uh, Johan, I'm not going to put my hand in your pocket. I'm not ready for that kind of commitment. It's one time a guy had a hole in his pocket, and that was rather traumatizing to me. I, I was looking for his wallet, and he gave me his phone number. I think it was a misunderstanding, and I don't want any more. He still writes. It's not communicating very well. Uh, so I'll give you something of mine. Now, this is going to be a bit of an exam. Based on what you saw Eric do, he showed you how to get in and out of pockets, so we're going to see how well you're paying attention. Now, I'll give you something of mine and I'm going to try to take it away from you. Can you turn this way so that they can see you as well? Hold out your left hand for me, just like this. Now, watch this very close. Pull up your sleeve so I you know you're not cheating, just like this. Squeeze it very tight inside your hand. Do you feel the coin inside your hand squeeze firm? Is it there? Hmm. Would you be surprised if I could take it out? Yes. Yes? Good. No, not, really. <laughs> not really. Not really? No. Open your hand. That's the obvious way, Johan. That's the easy way. Here. 
We'll make it harder. Hold my wrist. Squeeze firm. Watch close. If I drop it, it looks like it goes away. Open this hand. Spread your fingers. It's not between your fingers, because right now it's sitting on your shoulder. Take it off your shoulder. Oh, thank you. We'll do it again, Johan. Hold your hand up a little bit higher for me. Make sure I can see it there where you guys can see it as well. I'll do it slow for you. See, if we did it this way, it'd go right back on your shoulder again. <laughs> Johan, we're going to keep doing this till you catch it, okay? I might take a minute. Squeeze it very tight. Squeeze firm. Don't pull my finger. That's a different trick. It's back on your shoulder. Do you feel it on your shoulder? Perhaps the other one. Not yet. Show them it's not in the hand. It's not here. Open this hand all the way up. It's here. It's here. Put this hand flat on top of that hand. You have to watch close, Johan. Just making sure. This trick's more about the timing, really. I'll try to push it inside your hand. Does it feel like it's inside your hand right now? No. No, you can see where it is. It's sitting on top of your hand. I'll try to push it inside. Here we go. One, two, three. Back on the shoulder. No? Open your hands. Oh, just a second. Look. I missed. It's here. See, it appears in the air, falls right back in the hand. It's funny how that works. It's, it's, it's hard because you and I are so close, we can't see how it works. If you wiggle, it goes right back up. I'll do that again just for the amazing lack of response. That was amazing. Go right here where you can see. For the skeptics, can you see the little string? That's just the bifocals, actually. It doesn't really work. If you did it this way, it would go on you. Now, that's what's interesting. If I could put it in your pocket without you feeling it. It's not on the inside jacket, but there is a Johan. Mm. You had something here. Is this yours? No. Check it out. Make sure that that's exactly what that is. You had nothing inside the front pockets there. Everything is inside your pocket here, yes? You don't have anything in there? It's either the IRS or your ex-wife beat me to it, apparently. You don't have a whole lot else. If everything else? Good. All right. Well, we got together to get you a special gift. Just my mobile phone now. Oh, your mobile phone. Well, that way you can call if you're missing anything. I'm sorry about that. That's for you. But we all got together to chip in to get you a special gift, didn't we? In this case, it coincidentally looks a lot like the watch you were wearing. Very similar to yours, yes? Take the watch along with a big round of applause from all your peers. Thank you very much, sir. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. You did a great job. Now, you have to realize how scary that is to be in front of you. So can we give him another round of applause? That's very kind of you to be up here. Now, the type of work that I do is an interesting craft. It's a craft of deception. And magic is the art of deception. We usually accomplish most of this through using false assumptions and also controlling attention. But I think controlling attention, sometimes people think that's misdirection, and I think that's a misnomer. I think more specifically, there's a couple things that we're doing that might be of interest to your community. Specifically, for generations, magicians have talked about attention as being like a spotlight. They use that metaphor a lot, a spotlight. And recently, I've noticed that that's happening a lot in science as well, attentional spotlights. It's interesting that we're kind of going down the same path. I personally like to use the metaphor of attentional pie. When I'm working with someone, how I can cut their attention into a pie, and I can use that either to focus their attention or distract from it. So with attention, when we're talking about a spotlight, for us in magic, we would refer to a spotlight as being like focus or tension, that tension of a moment, that direction of when something's about to happen, when his hand is right here. But if I want to create relaxation, that's in the offbeat, when we joke, when I say, we'll do that again for the amazing lack of response, and then we get the laughs. But that laugh pulls the focus to all these other places where it's not in this laser beam. It laxes the focus. So I think that's an interesting idea when we're doing that here, how we can moderate. Because a lot of scientists, when I've heard them talk about this, they assume that magic has a predisposed uh, image of somebody's cognitive process. It's a lot of words for a Missouri boy. Uh, so exactly what is it that we're doing when we deal with an individual? Now, that fluctuates from different styles of magic. If you think of magic kind of like an undergrad, where all of us have a common knowledge. Eric and I come from the same background. Uh, there's a couple of magicians here in the audience as well. That We come from a similar place. But we specialize in different arenas. My area is on diversion on what people would typically call misdirection. And I'm very interested in how that applies to the real world. Outside of the magic context, how can that be used by pickpockets, thieves, diversion theft? How can that use, be used by the government? How can it be used to reverse that and be used by law enforcement? 
So uh, that's what you may have heard. I founded a company to glean that information from ex-thieves because they can't speak with law enforcement. They can't talk about that process because it's called fraternizing. They're a felon. They work with law enforcement. But if you can be the conduit in between that and you can help them communicate, you get to pick up certain information. Now, I say all this to you because I think one of those bits of information that is very interesting, it crosses outside of this dark world, but it goes into the business world. It goes in a lot of arenas. And that's what thieves call a grift sense. So a grift sense traditionally is the ability to almost, I think you might call it in science, like a biofeedback, where when I'm speaking to you, I'm constantly getting information, I'm adjusting my impressions and the things that I'm doing, and I'm moderating, adjusting those to match what I want you to perceive. There's tools that I'll use when I'm doing this with attention. Some, one of those, I'll cover three for you if we have a moment. One of those is proxemics, the use of personal space. So when I'm inside and I'm approaching, now if you noticed, uh, Johan, when he was helping me here, he squared up to me very much right off the bat, and he tried to keep a very square space. That also happens a lot when I perform for law enforcement. <laughs> they don't want to let you get in close, and they've been trained about that use of occupied space, and they're very aware of where you are. Now, how do I get inside that space? Uh, if we can use somebody uh, here that has a good set of legs on him. Actually, sir, you're sitting there holding cable. Do you mind if I borrow you for a second? Those cable will be fine for a moment. Come on up here. You still have a watch, too. This is like a, such a great situation. Come right here, sir. This is perfect. What's your name? Paris. Paris. Well, Paris, so in the way that I'm approaching you now, if I walk closer to you, you can see as I come closer when I reach your space, yes? Now I'm inside your space. Yes. Feels a little bit different? Yes. It does. Now, if I want to get inside your space while making you feel comfortable about that, I would break eye contact. So as I break eye contact, I would show you here, and now I'm very comfortably inside your space. Yes. Because it's smaller on the side. It's egg-shaped. At least that's what Edward T. Hall believes about this personal space. If I want to make you uncomfortable when I get in your space, I just keep eye contact all the way into your zone. <laughs> Now, that's interesting. If I keep that eye contact, what if, can we turn this way for me? Mm -hmm. and I appreciate you being up here for me. Face sideways like this so everybody can see as well. So I'm in this comfortable zone with you, but I don't want you to focus exactly on what I'm showing you here, so I might tilt my head. Now, naturally, when I tilt my head here, you'll want to look at me. Even if you don't look at me, there's this pie of attention that a portion of it will be cut, and you'll be realizing that I'm inside your space, and you'll want to look up. So it pulls your attention. That's basically one of the ways I use proxemics, for example. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So proxemics is one way. If I can start dividing his attention, I know that a portion of his attention, and I'm, I can't read someone's mind, but I can set up little barriers. I can set up little uh, flow charts for them to possibly go into. So if you're going in this direction or this direction, if you start to go that direction, I can get a good sense of where that is. That's where I go back to a griff sense. Because if I can moderate and I know when he's taking the bait on one place or another, it allows me to adjust things. For a pickpocket on the street, if they're stealing, it's not about the technique of the way that they get inside of a pocket and they split it open. It's not always about that. It's better if they can moderate where that person's attention is. If they have a clear understanding of where that is and how dedicated they are to their focal point, then they can literally put their whole hand inside and pull the item out. Now, there's certain techniques that you use to do that. Uh, now, I've noticed in my work, I work single-o, is it, what they call it on the street. Uh, so in a pickpocket team, traditionally there are positions like you'd have in football. There's the wire, the stick, the shade, the steer. They all work in concert together to distract your attention and get into your pockets. Uh, there are pickpockets that learn all those positions and they work by themselves or single-o. They're called cannons. So a cannon, when they're going in, they have to use certain movements that will distract your attention. Now for myself, in my line of work and through my past, I've learned certain movements draw attention, and they happen to parallel some of the findings in science. They seem to match up with smooth pursuits and saccades. So if I'm doing a smooth pursuit or if I do a half circle motion, I think Eric might have mentioned this earlier, that will draw the eye. It connects you in. You see this motion. And the best metaphor I can use is if you hit a baseball, you're going to watch from where it gets hit to where it's going. Those two points, the entry point, the exit point, A and B, and you're going to assume that information in between. Now, magic, we say, 
that you, uh, the larger move covers a smaller move, that you won't see if we do smaller moves while we do a bigger movement. I think that oversays it. I think it actually is something that we visually suppress these movements when they happen in the course of maybe a saccade. That's interesting perhaps where the research could go. So if I can do these two movements, what, what's dangerous about that for the type of work I do, if there's only two points, A and B, your attention can bounce back very quickly. So if I'm coming out of your pocket and I don't want you to see my extra hand, if I do a straight line, your attention is going to snap back like a rubber band to this other hand. But if I use an arch and I have more points of interest, now it's like hitting a line drive, but instead it's bouncing. So it bounces all the way across and your cat, your eyes follow it, just like a cat does a string as it goes across. So when it gets hit and when I come out of that space, the eyes, when I come out of his pocket, when I did that with the phone, I was drawing his eye here instinctually, even though he knows the nature of what I do, he's going to follow that motion because he's trying to catch it. So there's the second use, certain movements that draw the eye, proxemics. And the other one that I'm going to close this with is interior dialogue because I find it one of the most fascinating. If I can generate interior dialogue in your head, and what if I had the ability to suppress all your senses? to cut off that input, the way that the input was coming in, the way you processed your, the external stimulus. What if I could numb your sense of touch, mute your eyes, mute what you hear? That can manipulate a lot. So I believe that works similar to a daydream. If I can get you to second guess what I do and that raise a question in your mind, a lot of times that will pull your focus. So when I'm here, the game for him became catching that shoulder. So he's asking, he remembers when I touched his shoulder, which you didn't see, on the right shoulder, but I touched it in the back. So now a portion of his brain has to say, did he just put that on my other shoulder because I don't want to be busted again it's the third time? So that question, those statements, when they're happening inside of his head, it doesn't really matter about culture in this. I know when those hooks take place, and that's the moment I'm waiting for to take his watch. Now he can't feel the watch, even though it's a heavy watch, it's tightly strapped, Sometimes the same thing with a wallet. A lot of people have the misconception that a pickpocket bumps into you and they take your wallet. Well, that's a pretty crass way to do it. Because really, we wouldn't want to do that. Because if we bump into your wallet, I should say we, I guess I, my cousin's in the other field. Uh, I do have family in the business, but it's a different approach. Uh, when somebody bumps into you and hits your wallet, what are you going to do? You're going to tap your pocket, or later on you're going to recall, you know, when that guy bumped into me, he probably took my wallet. But like Eric was saying, if you could reframe that memory, if there was somebody on an escalator, a beautiful lady in front of a gentleman, one of the businessmen here, she stops, she bends over to pick something up, and he doesn't want to run into the back of her. Seems crass, he steps back. He's going to step back into a gentleman who already has his hand on his wallet and is just waiting for the right moment. So now he motivates the bump back to him, and the wallet is pulled, but he doesn't remember, remember it because he bumped the pickpocket. And it's erased. So those techniques, that with the interior dialogue. I met a pickpocket actually that uses this when he would steal. He would approach a couple, an older couple, and he'd ask the, she'd be with her purse. Here, he wanted to steal the wallet out of the purse. He'd go up to the guy and go, hey coach, how you doing? And as he said, hey coach, how you doing? The lady would look at him and go, when were you a coach? Or if she didn't, she'd at least say that in your head. What? And so with the gentleman, when was I coached? Maybe this guy's mistaken. But all that interior dialogue suppressed their senses. So he didn't need any cover. He didn't need the guy to play shade. He didn't need that cover. He could just literally pull the wallet directly underneath their nose. So interior dialogue, movements, and proxemics, they're useful tools. And the way you can reconstruct memory, if you can put it inside and I can make it about you, I can make it so you're not thinking offensively, but you're thinking defensively. If I asked you to shuffle a deck of cards, like if I were doing a card trick like Eric was doing, if I said, shuffle the cards, you're in a neutral position. You would now say, okay, I'll shuffle the cards, but you have room to think about things. If you think about attention like a boomerang, if you throw it out, that's misdirection. Most people say, oh, I want you to look at another place rather than here. We don't want you to do that. Because if you look at another place, your attention's going to come back when we don't want it to and hit us in the back of the head and you're going to catch us possibly. We would like to have a controlled environment. We would like to direct your attention. We're your guides and our job is to misguide you. We just do it lawfully. So if I, instead of saying shuffle the cards, if I said show me how you shuffle, now that question, just that simple change of words, show me how you shuffle, implies to you that there's something about the technique of your shuffle that says something about you. So now you're having internal dialogue, well, what's this going to say about me? And when you ask yourself that question, you don't realize that I've palmed off half the deck and that the deck is lighter. 
because it's about what's inside your head. So these are a few things, and I think it's interesting just to sum this up, that Albert Einstein said, reality is an illusion, albeit a very good one. And I think that a lot of this is, because if our senses and how we perceive things create our individual reality, so that means if I focus my attention looking at this wall for my whole life and somebody else looks at that wall, we have two different realities. Then that really means if somebody can control where you focus your attention, they can perhaps manipulate your reality. It's been a wonderful time. It's been a pleasure talking to you as well. Was this your wallet? No, sorry, Thomas Carew. That must be you. Tom? I believe this is Tom's. Have a wonderful time. Enjoy yourselves. He stole my microphone. Talk about tough acts to follow. I should just go home. Except that now we go into the next phase of the dialogue series. This actually is a, a real treat. Uh, but heck, we got to thank them one more time. <clears throat> So the second phase of the series, we're going to just sit up uh, uh, here on the couch and, and, and chat with Eric and Apollo. And I'd now like to introduce my colleague, uh, Susanna Montinez conde Susanna is the director of the Laboratory of Visual Neuroscience at the Barrow Institute uh, in Arizona. Uh, Susanna helped organize a seminal conference that really was important for the intersection between magic and, and neuroscience. She and her colleague, Steve Macknick, have really been the pioneers in this intersection. And the title of her symposium a couple years ago in Las Vegas was called Magic and Consciousness. I'm delighted she's able to join us today. Please welcome Susan. <clears throat> and let me call back to the stage Eric and Apollo. Come on up here, guys. <clears throat> We've lost our magicians. Sit down, down Susanna. So, Susanna, how have you been? <clears throat> We need Eric Bead, and we need Apollo Robbins. Yep. <clears throat> I think I see one. I think I see two. <clears throat> ah, Welcome. A comfy chair. It's not bad. It's not bad. <clears throat> well, the, the purpose of this phase of the, of the work is simply to have a chat. And maybe I'll begin the chat with, uh, with uh, getting to know you a little bit more personally. Most of us here, certainly Susanna and Steve excluded, and Stuart as well, who's a good magician, uh, don't have personal experience with magic. We love it, but we don't have personal experience. So share our personal experiences and yours. How did you, I'd love to hear from both of you in either order, how did you first get uh, interested in magic? What drew you to magic? And, and how did you decide that this is what you want to do for a living? You first. Me first? How did I get interested in magic? Yeah, and what drew you to it? When did, when did you first know that this was something you loved? Well, I think when I became fascinated with deception as a teen, I realized I had two directions to go. Since I was fascinated with deception, it was either going into magic or politics. So <laughs> <laughs> I chose the more honest of the two professions, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I had family that was involved with this. I had a couple of half-brothers that uh, were involved with crime. Uh, they were teenagers when I was young. My father was a minister, so I think that dichotomy helped influence the direction that I took. Uh, so <laughs> I, I know as a laugh, you should grow up with it. It's actually an interesting thing. Uh, so that becomes my family now. So the people that I work with, the criminals and the law enforcement, they actually become an extension of my family in a way. Uh -huh. While I can't completely trust them, uh, that area has influenced uh, my magic. So uh, the type of magic that I do is specialized in that arena. And did you imagine in those early days that you could actually do it for a living? Did you see that early on that you would actually end up on a stage like this talking to 10,000 neuroscientists about the work? If you're asking if I ever visualized when I was 15 and got into magic, whether I'd be standing or sitting in front of 9,000 neuroscientists, no. Uh -huh. uh, no <laughs> That's I, a tough one. That, actually, even probably a couple years ago, I wouldn't have quite visualized that. Uh, <laughs> But I think it's interesting to find when you pursue something outside of your normal career, whatever career it is, if you can find ways to adapt that into other care areas, that's where we can all take our cultures and our crafts further. Because if we stay stagnant inside of our own, we'll never extrapolate, we'll never grow. Otherwise, it stays incestuous. And I really appreciate this whole association because that seems what you're doing here. Terrific. Eric, what about you? 
I think he just said incestuous in front of a science <laughs> yeah. group. I'm not going um, there. I had a traveling dad, uh, and he used to come home on weekends and often brought surprises. And I the very first magic trick I ever remember, I must have been five, mm -hmm. was a little red thing that you put a nickel inside of, and you cover it, and it's a penny, and you cover it, and it's a dime, and then you can examine everything. And he drove me crazy with it for a couple of <laughs> weeks, and then eventually gave it to me. Uh, and then at age six, I really started buying magic books, and uh, Marshall Brodeen magic kit right here, hometown Chicago, Marshall Brodeen. Uh, and that was really what sunk the hook for me. No a book about Houdini and a box of plastic tricks at the age of six, and then yeah. seven, eight, nine. By nine years old, I was doing shows. When we were, had, had dinner in, in uh, Aspen, you mentioned that sometimes you would just go out on the street and perform just, you know, as a well, street yeah, kid. Well, yeah, for a while I was a real street performer, not like you see now right. on television, but the person, the, 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 the troubadour style, would go out and set up a table and draw an audience and do my act and pass a hat for money. Wow. I hitchhiked around America doing that. Like David Blaine. <laughs> and they're gonna yes. By the way, there's a hat going around right now for Eric. It's gonna, by the time it gets there, we can pay for your way home. That's right. Susanna, you may have a question. Yes, so, so Eric, you mentioned about reading books about magic, even at a very young age. And I, something that I found fascinating is that magic, even though it's an art, it has a very strong academic component. I was uh, very curious when I learned that magicians do a lot of research. They publish their discoveries, they communicate them to the field. So could you tell us a bit more about what does it mean? Tell us about, about this academic component of magic, how you go about discovering new tricks, new methods, new principles, communicating them to the field and establish <coughs> precedent for your discoveries. Well, magic has a very long and rich, rich literature uh, from not just in English, but uh, multiple languages going back centuries. Uh, the first English book that was published in Magic uh, that explained how magic tricks work was published in 1584. And that work continues today in lots of ways. Um, people who originate magic tricks write books, and there's journals and magazines that uh, cover the art and what's going on innovative-wise. And I think that there's very, really very much a correlation between the kind of work that goes on in science and the kind of work that goes on in magic in that we're, we're very concerned with where things come from and where they're originated and whether or not they, you know, it's, they're not quite peer-reviewed journals, but when people publish work uh, in various fields, you know, and magic is broken into specialties very much like science, so there might be a guy who's working on uh, a specific kind of uh, sleight of hand with cards and he publishes his work and other people go through it and go, you know, this isn't really his idea. If we go back 60 years to this book over here, we find this idea. Uh, and there are people who aren't performing magicians who are just scholars of magic and magic history. In fact, at the end of this month, the uh, Magic History Conference will happen in Los Angeles. It happens every couple of years, and they break out, you know, old pieces of conjuring uh, that haven't been seen in forever, and they perform them, and people give history talks about them. So when a magician makes a new discovery, Will he publish it immediately in a specialized journal or keep it close to his chest for a few months or years? Well, there are both approaches. <laughs> it really depends. You know, the magicians who perform for a living, like Apollo, like me, tend to want to keep secrets more because they're your personal tools. And, and the originality of my show is part of what makes it uh, valuable and different. But there are magicians, lots of magicians, very good ones, uh, who don't perform for a living, who get their recognition by publishing and by putting their material out and having their ideas performed by no others. Kidding. So uh, that's actually probably more of the community works that way. The minute they have a good idea, it goes out as a, either as a manuscript or as a product. Um, yes, does that answer the question? That is a good answer. <laughs> Would you like to add anything, Apollo? Well, I think the interesting idea with the publications, uh, Eric was referring to how our journals and the documents have uh, documented our history, also they show where the inputs come in, but one of the areas that also I've heard Eric talk about recently is where magic's going. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think is concerning for us, you know, because, uh, well, attention works differently live versus on camera, for instance, because camera is unyielding. So when I think and I'm performing for a TV or show or something like that, I have to factor in that I'm going to have to fool the cameraman as well. 
and I have to get inside his head. So now you see a lot of the young magicians, rather than going out and performing live with audiences, they practice in front of webcams and they're on YouTube. Mm. And it really desensitizes and doesn't give them quite the rounded experience that they need of getting that interaction and understanding that the majority of our craft isn't about the dexterity, but it's better about how we understand people. And there have been a number of inventions as well devised by magicians, uh, such as I read the first parachute, the first house alarm system, were invented by magicians, is this correct? Say that again. The first uh, house alarm system was invented by Maskeline, I believe. Uh, yes, yes. Well, you know, that's another, in the magic history, at the history conference, lots of the talks that go on there are about, you know, magic used to be in the forefront of technology. It's not so much anymore, although there's a bunch of uh, people that are pushing to get us back there. But the very first uses of electromagnets or among the first uses of electromagnets were uh, magic magicians on stage doing effects that were inexplainable, inexplicable, <laughs> because uh, people didn't know what electromagnets were, you know, and that history is, well, it's, it got broken at some point where magicians were really doing the older stuff and not pushing forward. But that history of magic and technology being tied goes up until probably the 50s or 60s pretty mm -hmm. strongly. Mm -hmm. And there are little pockets of it now, people that are doing work with lasers and people that are doing work with uh, other things that I won't mention <laughs> because I don't want to spoil the illusion. You don't, you don't wreck the fun. Let, let me uh, switch gears just a bit about uh, how, what gets in the way of your work or amplifies your work. So all of us by now in this room come to the world with, if you will, a statistical model of the world. By virtue of our experience over years, we've come to expect certain things to be a certain way. So none of our colleagues in this room are surprised walking in a room this size to see a stage at the front of the room in an auditorium. But they would be surprised if they saw a stage in a swimming pool. Well, probably not. They could probably put a stage in a swimming pool and we wouldn't notice it. But uh, having said that, so we, we built up expectations about what should be the case. Uh, how do you exploit that? How do you exploit the experiences that people bring to you when they come on the stage to you and what they should do? How do you take advantage of their expectations and either uh, use it or, or abuse it? Use it or abuse it. Uh, <laughs> I figures that would be the closing line that hands to me. Um, <laughs> The use and abuse of people's assumptions, uh, I think, is the other half of what we were discussing a while ago. When I was talking about controlling attention, yeah. uh, the assumptions is very important. It's imperative uh, because uh, all those actions, even into the most advanced technique that Eric was talking about when he came out with the rubber band, it's still the assumption that the purpose of that hand is to hand you the rubber band versus what it might conceal. We have a lot of materials on this, uh, written back in the 1930s, 1940s, about the use of simulation versus dissimulation of movements. So I'm simulating a movement or I'm dissimulating what the actual movement's cause is. And those are a lot of the techniques that we use, you know, that are, are in our toolbox that mm -hmm. help us accomplish the deceptions that we do. Right. And I think actually when he was talking about the technology, that that's part of where magic's going. Now because technology is becoming so rampant and the access to that information is so rampant, we can go on Google or if we don't know something, we look at, have this picture, we can Twitter it and we can find out what it's about. So now we become a very hungry society when we can't get an answer. Yeah. And I think that also becomes a tool because we become like the puppy dog chasing the guy, the guy stops and the dog runs past him. So that becomes another tool to manipulate people is now that hunger for information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of where the future of magic perhaps will go as, as the magic advances for the people that are going to be consummate performers and are going to take a new, new level. It's so, about uh, getting inside people's heads and finding what the current trends are to right. manipulate that. Right. And, and an extension of the question, in, in this audience there's a lot of folks that study how the brain develops. They're interested in how uh, our minds work. In fact, th this afternoon there's a spectacular lecture by a, a gifted cognitive scientist from MIT, Liz Spelke, who studies how kids develop numerosity, senses of number and quantity. So what if someone doesn't have a statistical model of the world, like a kid? They don't yet have a fully you know, assembled bit, bit of expectations. Uh, do you do a different kind of magic for them? Are they harder because they don't have these expectations? Or do they just think, sure, it's magic, we know that. What about with kids? Is it tough? Maps of reality. There are great, really great magicians who specialize in doing children's magic. And I talk to them a lot. 
and one of the things that comes up repeatedly is that they don't try to present magic to small children as if it is quote-unquote magic, because what's more interesting to a child who doesn't know the difference between what's possible and impossible is surprise. So yeah. they like surprises, and they like flashes of fire, and they like bright colors, and they like uh, novelty, basically, is what the great children's magicians do. And there should be some things built in that kids are puzzled by, uh, pouring milk into a glass and then having it disappear and not be in there, is something that they could understand is, that's not my experience, that's impossible. <coughs> yeah. But for real, for, for really um, deep mystery and, and trying to make someone believe that they, or not believe, but trying to give someone the experience of seeing something really impossible, mm -hmm. children don't yet have a model of the world that right. allows them to, to differ. You know, it's just as amazing to a kid when you push the button here and the television goes on across the room. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> as it is if you can find the card they're thinking sure, of. Sure, sure. Right? Exactly, that's a great metaphor. Susanna, you may have a question. Something that may be a difficulty in doing magic for children as well is the fact that children are not going to hold their attention to focus it for long periods of time, and so it may be more difficult to manipulate. As Apollo was saying, you don't want the attention loose in the room, but you want to know exactly where it is. I find that for a lot of adults, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in fact, <laughs> James Randi, the, the amazing Randi, he, he mentioned several times that he finds that the people who are most easily fooled by magic are those with PhDs. Oh, so, yes, yes. Because they can focus, perhaps? Perhaps because they can focus their attention for longer. You know, ADHD, uh, the dispute of whether that's something that's affected by how often we surf the internet and whether we've developed as a culture shorter attention spans because our minds aren't properly trained like we do our bodies, so we're actually maybe corrupting our mind by <clears throat> information overload. Uh, those types of things uh, also seem to factor in like when you perform for somebody with autism you know, mm -hmm. and how their attention, uh, it doesn't quite have the same kind of feel. So if you were to try to uh, steal from me, or uh, for myself generally, I don't steal from me who is autistic because the audience doesn't <laughs> empathize with me very well. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> wow. on, the, on the occasion though, when I'm performing That's magic. That's a take home message if I've ever heard That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm performing magic though, I've noticed that the attention can shift and also that their gaze won't affect the same gaze. So I have to spend a lot more time moderating than I would just finding out the direction that they go and go with yeah. it. I have to constantly stop, moderate, where are you at, and then wait and then get them to convince and focus. Right. So how do you go about you? We have talked in the past about uh, the training of a magician. And uh, I remember in a, in a previous conversation that uh, you, Apollo, had said that a beginning magician will first learn about sleight of hand then about angles, and finally about misdirection. Now, a lot of magicians appear to be self-taught, at least initially, so having this self-training outside of the traditional realm of psychology or neuroscience, how do you learn about the manipulation of attention and to do it so effectively? <laughs> I think you know, Eric and I both would have probably very similar perspectives on this. I think. Uh, Again, if you do go along that lines, that initially when somebody is interesting magic, they just want to know the technique, how it works. Uh, what is the technique? How can I teach my fingers to do those things? And then for a professional magician, it's how quickly can I forget those techniques, master those, and let those go on autopilot? And then how to calculate the angles? Because very quickly, you have to externalize your focus. I have to calculate where someone's attention is, where those angles are. So the first part is calculating uh, whether they can or can't see certain things. And then that next step to be able to get inside their head and understand that psychology. For a lot of the magicians, I feel like there are, are lectures and books on those things, but I think it really is for a performer about spending the time performing enough and also being self-aware enough to understand when you are competent and when you're incompetent. So a lot of magicians will never make it to that level. I think that's a little bit of survival of the fittest there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I want to make sure we have time for our, our colleagues in the audience to chat with you as well. So let me ask a final question of both of you. Over the last months, even years, you've both been in contact with, obviously, Steve and Susanna and other magicians, and, but they're also very interested in neuroscience, and you've been in contact with neuroscientists as well. Has your experience with us, writ large, 
change the way you think about magic or perform your craft? Does neuroscience influence, I don't mean formally, like you go read a journal, but, but by virtue of being interested in the brain, as both of you are, has that informed your own craft in any way? Uh, for me, it really hasn't yet, but uh -huh. I have hope that it will. You know, yeah. my little 10 minute or whatever talk today uh, was trying to point in what I think a direction that might be very fruitful. Sure. Collaborate, uh, collaborative, you know, effort between conjuring and neuroscience. I, I think that what's been going on is really interesting. And I think that there are some things that maybe I wouldn't have thought of um, before. But it hasn't really, there's been nothing that was a big aha. Right. Because kind of what's happening so far is uh, Susanna and, and her colleagues that are looking at magic are kind, are, are in a way, proving what magicians already kind of know. I mean, sure. we're not scientists, but I know uh, things about how motion works and how eyes work. I don't know what's going on, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, right, but just right. through experience and performing, some of the things that they are now proving are things that we know and have used for hundreds of years. Exactly. Um, exactly. But I do hold out hope that as, as they continue, this collaboration continues, and as more and more things get looked at, more and more avenues uh, of what magic knows get looked at by scientists, we will get some real ahas. Yeah. Well, and I know, think that that's likely. It's, it's very interesting because the field of neuroscience as magic is evolving. And there are brand new career paths for our young colleagues in the audience. The field of neuroscience now has areas of neuroethics or neuroeconomics. And one of these intersections that's now coming up is, is exactly this, that uh, 10 years ago, if we had had this conversation, it would have been fun over a beer, but it wouldn't be possible to think in this scholarly context, we'd actually be using magic as a window on the brain. Right. That's terrific. Well, let me then turn to our final uh, phase of the morning. Uh, this has been a wonderful chat. We've been hogging the stage. Let me turn to, I can't see out there very well, but Emily and Stuart and Steve, I'm sure we have uh, lots of questions from the audience that they'd like to ask. The way we'll do this is please send your questions to the front. Each of our colleagues will in turn ask a question of Eric and or Apollo. Uh, and then we'll uh, continue the dialogue as long as we have time for it. I can't quite see who's first up. Emily, are you first up? Why don't you go first? Okay, is this on? Yes, okay. You're on. <laughs> So the uh, first question actually is for you, Apollo, and it came from a number of different sources in the room, which is... Uh... They want their watch back. <laughs> have you ever been pickpocketed? I have one time uh, where I set myself up for some gypsies in... Uh, it was in Granada, Spain, at the Alhambra. There were some lady gypsies that were working outside the tourist spot. I saw that they were setting up and they were trying to pickpocket different people. So I jumped into the frame and put myself in the position because I just wanted to see what it felt like. So Would you like a... your phone back? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so do you think then, as just as a follow-up, that you're relatively inured to being pickpocketed? No. And I think that that's the biggest problem for both law enforcement that thinks that and also the average American is because they think that they're impenetrable to, to it. They say, I oh, know I would feel that. I would know difference. Or I keep it a, with a rubber band in my front pocket and that keeps me safe. All those assumptions are exactly what's going to get them hit. So for me, I believe completely I can be pickpocketed and that's probably one of the things that might help me a little bit. Steve Hi. or Stuart? Yes, so uh, this is a question about gender differences in magic. Seem to be a lot of males compared to females in the field of magic. Do you want to say something about what the uh, future career opportunities might be? Ava Doe, can you stand please? <laughs> yes. Ava. Stand up, Ava. Uh, I... A gifted female in finishes. <laughs> don't, I don't know if this is really why, but I'm going to make a guess at why there are so many more magicians than women in magic. And I think it's because um, most people get interested in magic when they're children. And I think little boys are more interested in power <laughs> than little girls are. I'm not sure of this. Uh, this is just a guess. But, you know, the magician is, the, is a role of power. It's the guy who can do anything, who knows the secrets, who can fool you. And when you're an 8-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old boy, that's a very kind of seductive idea. 
And almost all men go through a magic phase in their childhood or adolescence, but for some reason, not so many women. And I, I think that it's that issue of a child wanting power uh, that might be why that is. James Bond, Spycraft, it's also those things, because it's like a fun version of spy tech in a way, because we got all these fun toys and we get this whole deceptive world uh, that uh, kind of creates that kind of appeal too. Terrific, thank you. There's no evidence, I'm just guessing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know that I'm talking to scientists and they go, well, he, he doesn't know that. And you're right, I don't know that. It's a guess. <laughs> Eric, it's never stopped us in the past, not to worry. <laughs> Steve, you have a question for us. Yeah, so uh, here's a really good question about the hierarchy of movements you might do to distract someone. So could you talk a little bit about how specific movements may distract attention more or less? Um, we, you talked about pursuit and, and saccades already, but could you elaborate on, um, on, on manipulating the attention with larger or smaller things? Would you like to? Uh, well, I'll give you one uh, little piece of information and then I'll let Apollo talk uh, about this. But um, there is a term in magic and a technique in magic called an in-transit action. And what this means is you can conceal an action not by doing a bigger action around it but by making it part of something so that the small action happens on the way to doing something else. And the classic example is... Um, I have something in my right hand, and I'm going to put it into my left hand, and I don't want you to see it, even though I can't hide it. I mean, it's going to happen right out in the open, but I'm going to do this, and you're not going to see it. And so what I do is, I've got this thing in my right hand, I make this transfer a necessary part of something else. So I look to someone at my right, and I say, my name is Eric, what's your name? And now this, this action of reaching to shake his hand completely covers yeah. this Secret, even though it's not secret, it happens right out in the open, but back to memory, you can't encode it. You don't encode it to memory because this action is what you remember. If someone asks, what did he do? Well, he reached over and shook the other guy's hand. Right. They don't even see that you, this goes from one hand to the other. Arturo de Escaño is a Spanish magician who wrote very deeply about all of these things, and that's his term for that is an in-transit action. Terrific. Thank you. And uh, the same thing with uh, visual suppression. When we see those types of things, uh, sometimes even inside of our frame, I, that's for myself, I've been collaborating a little bit longer with the neuroscience community. So finding that feedback of uh, terminology and the actual physiological uh, evidence of certain types of things is much more interesting to me than uh, just having theories bouncing around inside my head and folk knowledge and intuitions. I like to have that kind of empirical evidence to know this is why that's happening. I mean, the best that we can as humans, what we can come up with. So for me, that area of social psychology, these, uh, the neuroscience, in this case with the movements, uh, I have some theories that, that like when a deck of cards, there's a technique that you can use where you can go back and forth through the pocket with these straight lines. And the, an audience, even this size, even though I only have two hands and it's a small frame for you, you wouldn't see that the whole deck will vanish and there'll be one card in my hand. It's because it seems that you're suppressing it for some reason or another, and even though it's in your field of vision, you seem to spotlight so detailed that you suppress the things around it. And I think that those types of motions, whether it's using some kind of psychotic suppression, attentional blinks, uh, whether it's something with your mirror neurons, I'm interested to learn a lot more about it. Interesting. Emily, you're up. Okay, well, I think uh, this question is actually a perfect interface between magic and neuroscience, um, and probably for the whole panel. Can a subject's response during a magic trick, um, for example, their susceptibility to being fooled, be used in a scientifically diagnostic sense for neurological diseases, potentially at an early stage? Is there? My goodness. I think that's a question for Susanna. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I don't know anything about <laughs> neurological disease and how it's diagnosed, so I, you know, probably is my answer, but I don't really know anything about it. And one thing that I, that I do know is that every time I talk like I'm smart when I actually don't know what I'm saying, I end up looking really bad. So I'm just, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'd say Apollo already pointed a little bit uh, towards the answer of this question. Um, he mentioned because magic is about the manipulation of attention, it makes sense that such neurological disorders that involve attentional deficits 
might have something to do, might affect the way that that subject perceives magic. For instance, uh, Steve Magrick and I have uh, hypothesized that uh, people with autism, because of their deficit in joint attention, might be less susceptible to magic tricks. So joint attention mm -hmm. are the social, uh, works because of the social cues the magician uses. When the magician wants the audience to look at him, he will look at the audience. When the magician wants the audience to look at an object, he will look at that object himself. People with autism don't react to this type of cues. And if so, they may be fooled less easily. And if so, and we have some anecdotal evidence that this may be the case. If this is the case, then you might think that you might develop some test based on uh, the ability to get fooled by magic tricks or not as a differential diagnostics of uh, sure. deficits in joint attention sure. and autism. Absolutely. And actually, the, the, the flip side of that from Emily's question is interesting, and I'm absolutely a tyro here, but it may well be that magic could be therapeutic. You could grab someone's attention, grab someone's awareness in ways, because you're experts at that, where other folks can't access them, like in autism, like in other diseases. So not only might it be a diagnostic, but in the limit, and I'm obviously winging it here, it could be another means of getting a hold of someone's attention and their soul. And, and I would add to that, I think it would be very interesting if Apollo could tell us about uh, the benefits that uh, the practice of magic may have for a neural rehabilitation. You mentioned that uh, in the past you had some uh, motor problems as a child and you used magic to overcome this. Mm -hmm. When I was young, uh, I was diagnosed with fine and gross motor problems. Uh, it was a difficulty perhaps due to my parents having uh, mismatched blood types. I had braces on my legs when I was a kid. That's probably, to be honest with you, affected a little bit about me not getting involved with the mischief that my half-brothers were in. Uh, but <laughs> couldn't chase them around. I couldn't get away as fast. Uh, so uh, with my hands, though, I was the kid with the rubber ball with the pencil that had to use both hands to try to write. And at first it was drawing to help identify those things. But then magic very much became uh, an influence on my hands. It became wow. something that uh, was a therapeutic excess for me because I had to learn isolations. Like in dance, you would learn with jazz. So I learned to isolate movements with my hands and learned to be able to do those without a direct connection uh, that I had to think about that process. It became a... Uh, uh, an unconscious action that I had that mastery of that I didn't have before. And magic was the bridge for me in that. Wonderful. Thank you. Stuart, what you got? Yes, so uh, coming back directly to magic, um, when you select people from the audience, what are the kinds of things you look for? Presumably these were really not stooges. These were really legitimate people from the audience. You don't have to use the word presumably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what do you, what do you look for? Is this question being asked so that someone can avoid being chosen next yes. time? Um, I'm, it depends on what I'm going to do. Uh, you, because you want different types of people with different types of personalities and, and for different kinds of demonstrations on stage. So today, when I walked out there, <laughs> hi, um, I was looking for someone who looked like they would be comfortable in front of this large of an audience, so someone who was engaging my direct eye contact, mm -hmm. and someone who looked happy, and uh, someone who was slightly shorter than me, so that I could hold her head and put her in the chair without having a really weird body motion and people saying, what the hell's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> so someone a little bit shorter than me who was happy and looked like they'd be comfortable up here was all I was looking for today. What about you, Paula? Uh, for me, I was looking at quite a few different people. I think some of you saw me before the show. I was walking out and taking a look. Uh, it is most important for me the comfort level. And for this situation, it makes it much harder to find an audience member that's going to have comfort standing in front of an audience this size. So that's why I said, let's give him another round of applause for encouragement. Actually, do you mind if we do that again? Because it was very <laughs> kind of you to do that, sir, to come up here with me. Because. While standing in front of a group and speaking is a big fear for a lot of people, it's also, I mean, the idea of standing here, checking your ego, and allowing yourself to knowingly know that someone's going to steal from you is another thing. And that's very hard, especially for a man to do sometimes, right. is to check his ego and say, you know what, I'm going to let this happen to me. And for me to be able to find a person that's comfortable with that, uh, again, he was uncomfortable with the idea of uh, what am I going to do right away to steal from him, but he very quickly uh, developed a rapport with me, which I really appreciate your help. Fun, good. Steven? 
So here we have a question about um, how do these same type of techniques, um, are, are they used in terms of manipulating public opinion and advertising? And a, and a secondary question that came up with a similar is, how did Jesus turn water into wine? Please comment. <laughs> please comment on early prophets. <laughs> how did Jesus turn water into wine? Watch well, them toss that, that one around. Product? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> repeat the first part of that. I got so distracted by water and wine that I forgot what I was being asked. So the question is really, are politicians and advertisers using these techniques to manipulate us? And can we also in the lab do that, I think is with the extension of this. I, I think without question, uh, lots of the techniques of persuasion and of subliminal hinting and of language trickery are used uh, all the time, uh, both for our benefit and against us in, in generating um, consensus and in making products popular. Uh, I think without question all the time, M many of the same techniques that magicians use, especially the verbal trickery. Mm -hmm. you, know, you remember when I was talking about planting a lie, how you connect two things with, with the word and and get them to agree to the second part and therefore they have agreed to the whole thing. Well, this I see in advertising all the time. Sure. A and B, yes, and actually you, you're agreeing to B. But because they're connected, you're right. agreeing to A and B, and you, you do that enough repetition, you'll agree to A and B eventually. But you know, the, that, trick, that little verbal trick is used all the time wow. in fields outside of magic. The area of rhetoric, generally, is a fascinating study, logical thinking versus rhetoric. And for me, I had never been interested in politics at all, until this last election, when some of the debates were so transparent when the rhetoric popped up that for me, my radar popped up and that became my occupation. I mean, I forgot about work, I sat there, studied, and I ordered a ton of textbooks and uh, materials just on Aristotle's philosophies of different things, and I'm pretty much transcribing as I'm watching these different talks of, oh, this is what's happened, here's where they made the mistake with the rhetoric, why is it so transparent? Mm. Uh, so when you ask about with the politics, yes, I think it completely affects the politics, it affects advertising, the differences with magicians, we tell you that we're manipulating you. So as an audience, you're agreeing <laughs> as a contract that you're here and you're going to allow us to misguide your attentions for entertainment. But if we didn't make that claim, we would be charlatans. And we could uh, instead take your money and we can create a new religion. And we could turn water into wine. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent answer. Emily, what you have? Okay, well, I think uh, this next question follows uh, quite smoothly from the question about politicians, um, <laughs> which I'm is full of dread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> is there any evidence um, for magic and its broadest sense of misdirection rhetoric, as you say, um, in non-human primates, for example, in chimpanzees, either performing or misdirecting? Um, or actually appreciating magic. The actual question as it's worded, has anybody ever tried to perform magic for non-human primates? Oh, I, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to perform magic <laughs> from primates. I've done it at a zoo. I thought it was funny, but I, the motion of uh, having an item of food, I mean, anybody has taken and pretend to throw a toy for a dog and watched the dog just go like this. <laughs> uh, so I think we've all done that. Uh, but it does, I mean, a little bit more complex form of that. It's really funny to uh, do this with a monkey. Yeah. Uh, it's when a monkey's trying to follow the things and they want that, and it's not there. It's rather perplexing to them and why that doesn't happen. But do they like it the way Do they like it? People they didn't, do. They didn't give me a report. Uh, <laughs> they don't, they don't uh, applaud when it, <laughs> they do the thing, but uh, they seem rather astonished because their map of reality is getting a little tear in it. It's not matching up with what... So they feel like it, somehow it's fallen, usually. So the first thing is a natural of where did it go. Sure. Uh, but other things, sometimes I actually just performed uh, for an International Police Chiefs Association, and they had a group from Nigeria there, one of the police chiefs from there. And I understood the pickpocketing went over fine. When I broke into that and did a little bit more of an uh, effect where I wave my hands and use shadows to move the cards around and they begin moving in space, I got a completely different reaction from the gentleman from Nigeria. And uh, they, what is that, what is that, and just a paranoia and a backup. And that's where it can become almost cultural. Wow. Of, uh, it's a totally different thing uh, because they're not so used to what we see on TV here. Sure. Interesting. Stuart? Oh, I'm sorry, please, Susan. 
just as a, no, no, there is a video in uh, YouTube of uh, an Asian magician, I forget the name, performing for a chimpanzee. Oh, really? Looks like a, <laughs> a young chimpanzee, and uh, he seems to be reacting more or less in the same way that a small child would, right? oh, yeah. uh, being uh, surprised that a confetti instead of water comes out of a bucket, things like that. <laughs> Interesting. Like it's much harder to find their billfold. It, it's ill-concealed. Oh, the billfold. They usually don't miss their watch. That's you know. right. <laughs> Yeah. Stuart. I'm going to try and uh, combine a couple of uh, questions Should together. Should we go to another and give you time, or you're okay? No, no, I've got it. Go for it. Uh, so the world of science and neuroscience, especially now, is aimed in a lot of ways on intellectual property and uh, oh, patenting yeah. and uh, controlling our intellectual Who property and our discoveries. But the world of magic doesn't really have that history. It has been more of a brotherhood where people share things, or at least they tell whose trick it might be based on as they go forward with a new uh, version of the trick. But it, is that changing or is that going to change over this as it becomes more and more of a uh, kind of corporate uh, point of view? Eric just did a presentation at one of our largest conferences on this subject, so that's Eric's answer. Uh, uh, it's not true that this that magic has always been a brotherhood and that stealing is not what happened um, in the history of magic. In fact, a great deal of the advances, especially in the stage illusion uh, arena, the guys that perform the big, big tricks and traveling stage shows uh, from the last 150 years or so, we're almost all stealing from each other. And in fact, there's a famous uh, the levitation effect where uh, a magician hired the other magician's right-hand man out from under him to oh, wow. rebuild and, and help him to reconstruct this uh, levitation trick. So there's a long history of stealing and intellectual property problems and people hating each other and being angry. Uh, the issue or the problem with it is that magic isn't really protectable. I mean, you can mm -hmm. take out a, a patent on, on an invention or you can, you can protect a script in its form, but there's really no recourse in magic for someone stealing your idea and doing whatever they want with it. Uh, so, aside from alienation. Aside, well, yes. So what we use is peer pressure, <laughs> Good. which is marginally effective. <laughs> So linked to that same question is exactly that issue of somebody like the masked magician who begins to reveal uh, alleged uh, uh, ways of how these tricks are being done. What's the impact of that? Of the masked magician? Well, the masked magician uh, has, if you ask me, no impact at all. Because A, uh, the people who do really watch that show and repeatedly watch that show have some sort of passing interest in magic or it wouldn't be interesting in the first place. And B, he's revealing secrets that are not really secrets. I mean, we live in the age of information. If, if you want to know how almost any trick in the world works and you have any kind of skills with a search engine, you know, if, you, if your Google foo is reasonably, <laughs> you know, sharp, uh, there's not much that you can't find out by digging around. And so I think that most people just aren't that interested in looking at what the secrets of magic are. And the problem with that show is not that he's revealing secrets. The problem is that I, I think it's kind of demeaning. The attitude and, the, and yes. the tone of that show is, now that you know the secret, magic's kind of stupid, isn't it? And there's just yeah. this kind of overriding tone to it that I think is awful. But I don't think it's damaging me uh, or anybody else, really. Do I wish it were not on the air? Yes, I do. Because emotionally, I think it sucks. And, <laughs> but intellectually, I think it's, it's innocuous. That's and a technical an, magic term that they use. <clears throat> on an emotional side, I would like to say that as well, because I think the, the mass magician specifically, uh, he doesn't affect magic as far as the secrets that he goes out. He, he does that as his branding. It's like Chris Angel doing what he does, right. or David Blaine. So that's what he does. And it's because he's not exposing the, the real secrets of magic. Daryl Fitzke, who is a very prominent writer in our 1940s in magic here, he said that the true secrets of magic about the magician's ability to handle his audience's perceptions and manipulate their attention. If 
Valentino, the masked magician, was able to do those, he could have a show and have a real job and not have to sell out and get a TV show where he had to expose those secrets. <laughs> but he doesn't have those skill sets, so that's not what he exposes. He exposes what he can buy at the magic shop and do the next week. So it's not really an effect for any kind of professional magician. In fact, for us, a lot of times it makes it easier because the audience feels like they're educated and it puts a bigger chalk mark on their back. Uh -huh. That's why police, are, police fact, are good marks. Yeah, in fact, you were asking earlier about um, taking advantage of assumptions. Yes. Well, the greatest one is the magician who thinks he knows something or the person who knows something about magic. Yeah. Oh, yes, I used to do card tricks myself. <laughs> and, you know, when that guy sits down, it's just, <laughs> right. you know. You guys will go, all right. <clears throat> yeah. Gotcha in my gun And sight. so someone who watches The Masked Magician, the next time they go see a really good show, yes. Penn and Teller, David Copperfield, a big show, where some of the tricks look like those tricks he's done, you'll be sitting there going, oh, yes, I saw The Masked Magician do, wait a minute, that's not how what. Huh? <laughs> yeah. And I think that you'll be doubly fooled thinking that you're wise uh, by Absolutely. watching that show. Well said. Steven? And to wait one last thing, oh, to no, reiterate please. his point, and, and I think this is important not for you, but for Apollo and I. Uh, if he were really a good magician, he would just do a magic show. And so what you're watching is a lousy magician explaining yes. bad magic. <laughs> <clears throat> I think we opened Pandora's box with that one. <laughs> Steven, a question, please. So here's a couple of paired questions about how much individuals vary. So if we're going to set up experiments in the laboratory, we need to have an idea of how different subjects are going to react in order to design the experiments correctly. And the same must be true for you. How rigid or predictable are people's responses to your misdirection? And how much do they, do they vary across, you know, from person to person? And how do you deal with it? Uh, I'll start. Um, Above all else, magic is a performance art. It happens. There is no magic if there's not the magician and the audience. And the whole thing is being present and things happening in real time. And I think that people's responses are, there are some areas where you can kind of contain it and know that there's, their response will be in a certain range. But the game of magic is reading people and adapting constantly to them and their reactions and their attention. And so I don't know really how you design experiments that would be universal uh, because you basically have to take all the variables out. And what I'm trying to say and not saying very well is it's almost all variables yeah. in performance. Yeah. You are constantly adjusting your timing pulling things out of the show, putting things in, making sure that you have everyone's attention for the next part or making sure their attention is split for the next part. For things like how eyes move, you can absolutely design experiments. But for things that the magician does that are performance kind of based things that might be really uh, interesting to neuroscientists, I don't know how you design an experiment that will work on everybody every time to get some result. My but I'd guess, be willing to talk to some people about this. My, my guess is that, th that you, who are both so good at your craft, make your living being able to adjust to that variability. If you, if you expect one particular response and now you don't get it, now you're in trouble. But you, you've got a whole range of expectations about what to expect. And after a lot of experience, my guess is that's armed you with a lot of possible responses to that variability. And you have to consider the range of what magic is. There are so many sides to magic. When an illusionist is doing a show, he is not necessarily adjusting to that audience live. What he's doing in that context is a predisposed expectation of what the audience is going to perceive. Right. So while Eric and I do a certain style that we are moderating this biofeedback and adjusting to our audience that we see, when we speak for magic as a whole, there are portions of magic, mm -hmm. I think, where the eye is drawn, where that tracking and what we developed, so because obviously you have to exploiting an optical illusion gives you a a ga grasp of what happens in the mind when you understand how that shortcut works. So I think the same thing's true with magic. And that's one of the things that's been fantastic. I, we, were, we were rather opinionated about what we said about the mass magician, but on the other side, I think that this is a neat opportunity for us, and it's been a fantastic thing of being here, because by you having us here and listening to this side of what magic is, you give magic a different respect, rather than people that ask, can you saw a woman in half? Can you pull a rabbit out of a hat? Because that doesn't show anything about the academic side or this other world what magic can and what it can, has to offer. Wonderful. So you had a brief comment? It, it seems to me that at least um, 
that in terms of subject variability, that magic is as, at least as resilient as, if not more, than your typical cognitive neuroscience experiment. I mean, magic shows work for people of all ages, genders, education levels, and so forth. So I think this is eminently approachable from a scientific point of view. And it really points out to the fact that uh, they're very elementary uh, principles about how our attentional system is hardwired in our brain. Exactly. That's why we're here, to collaborate with you. Absolutely. So our time is getting very short. We have one last question, Emily, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, well, um, this one then is a sort of future-oriented question. The topic of the future of magic um, and performing came up, and someone in the audience would like to know where you see magic and performing going in the future. Are there sort of any big you know, revolutions or evolutions coming down the horizon? I think that part of what you're doing here is giving us certain tools. I think if we can explain to an adult audience why they should watch and subject themselves to having their suspension relief or to suspend belief, because if I'm doing something, I'm asking you to pretend like I have, really have powers, that's going to insult your intelligence. So I think the future of magic is about not insulting the audience, but embracing their intelligence and allowing them a little bit of perspective mm. about what process we go through. And the more of that transparency that you can show, the more that we'll appreciate it as an art versus being uh, somewhere around what people associate clowns, mimes, jugglers, and magicians. Terrific. I, I think that um, with, with magic uh, being so prevalent on TV and in the internet and stuff, I think we're going to, this is just a guess, but I think we're going to start to see a return to uh, live performance being where mm. magic is rather than TV, movies, and such. And so a kind of an anti-technology yeah. movement, I think, is going to start to happen. We hope so. In the next 10 years. My, it's just a guess, but maybe. Ed educated. But you've written in a prediction envelope that you've mailed off and stamped, so. And I'm going to get Randy to cough up the million. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could spend another two hours with these wonderful gentlemen, but... Uh, Let's do. Uh, we could. <laughs> well, we plan to. It's, you're you're going to be here for a while. You should know that both Apollo and Eric asked to spend time in the meeting with us learning about what we do as well. We were thrilled about that, and of course, we invite them to spend as much time as they want. Uh, so just a brief closing comment. When, when I first met Apollo uh, with uh, Marty Segezi, the executive director, and I joined Apollo for dinner uh, in Las Vegas, and then a few weeks later, we joined Eric uh, in, at his hometown of Aspen, Colorado for dinner. Uh, we were charmed, as you have been, I'm sure, but in addition, um, they dazzled us with their magic. And you know what? They can't help themselves. This is in their souls. I mean, this is not something they do just for a living. It's something they absolutely love. And with both Eric and, and Apollo, I, I mentioned on the way out, independently, of course, that I didn't want to know how they did their tricks, that I loved the sense of wonder. Well, this morning, you have given us two hours of uh, amazing dialogue and discussion, and we've learned a great deal. But I want to thank you most for leaving us with much to wonder about. Thank you very much. Great day. Thank Fabulous you. day. Apollo, nice doesn't get any better. Eric Mead, Apollo Robbins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want me to go this way? Oh, it was wonderful.